Bob by Jack Beck and, and Gabriel Horowitz Prisco, a duet. Good afternoon, Chairman Farrell, Chairman DeFrancisco, members of the legislature. I thank you for roughing out a long day, and I, I'll keep my remarks brief, but I do believe I have some significant words to say here today, and I would rather also keep myself available to any questions you have today or in the future. I believe in quality in our information, not quantity, and I hope to keep it that way. One thing I do want to touch on that was touched on earlier, and I know my purpose here is not to rebut the, the commissioner's testimony or anyone else's testimony, but to say that prison violence is at an uptick is quite the underplay. What we face today is a five-year high on every measure of violence within our prison system, whether it's assaults on inmates, assaults on staff, contraband, so on and so forth. Lockdowns, medium and maximum. To underplay that there is not an issue in the medium facilities is quite an understatement. I've never seen it in my 32 years, I'm three years ahead of the road as far as the acting commissioner, I have not seen this type of violence, especially in medium security facilities. And this is what we're facing today. The uptick or expansion of violence within this system has grown by over 120 assaults on staff within one year from 2012 to 2013. That is unacceptable. And I can only point to one thing that has caused this over five years, and that's the consolidation and closure of facilities with, I believe, Senator Marchion pointed out very clearly, without a plan. I've been sitting here for six years as president of this organization, testifying, talking about taking a step back and looking at right-sizing the system. We need to do that. We're at a crisis. Many of you know, many of you have been here, you know that in 1990, 1999, never had enough cell space or bed space for 72,000 inmates. It never happened, never would have happened in the state. We had inmates stuck in gymnasiums, double bunked, as the as acting commissioner Anucci stated, 90 inmates in a 60-man dorm, inmates stuffed in every nook and cranny, inmates on draft buses without beds for them. And those members, all correctional personnel, did a heroic job during those times, and we got through them. Today, I believe we're creating that same crisis by consolidating the system to a point where this violence obviously has shown an increase. We have a more violent offender within the system, and they're in cr more cramped quarters. This isn't Oz. Don Rowe wasn't sitting, sitting at a pod with 30 cells in front of him. This is interaction, whether it's in a maximum security facility or a medium security facility, every single day with individuals, and some of them becoming very violent. The, assistant, or the acting commissioner spoke about Auburn and an issue with Auburn. I toured Auburn immediately after the lockdown. Those officers do a hell of a job there, and they react to incidents very quickly and diffuse instances. The, the ones that caused this lockdown were one of those. But you know what they said? They said to me, we had four perpetrators in the yard that immediately ate up all of our resources, and we were worried about everybody else still running the facility. Those are the issues that are facing this agency. It's underfunded, whether we talk about overtime, unfunded mandates, whether it's mental health, heater trips, hospital trips. This is an underfunded uh, agency that has, been that has been squeezed to the point 
of his zero growth, cut spending, those are great buzzwords, but when we're talking about public safety and public safety of servants who perform the most dangerous job in law enforcement, I think we have to take a closer look and not take a hatchet approach to something we should be using a scalpel on. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions, whether it's about double bunking or overtime, whether it's now or in the future. Senator Caliban. Oh, thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, President. Uh, welcome. Thanks for hanging in there. I'm very in intrigued. Um, you talked about the violence at a five-year high and very concerned about it. Uh, but as soon as you testified about that, my note to self was, what do you attribute the causes to? And you talked about the larger picture, a, a larger a big picture, consolidation, closure, I mean, the idea of right-sizing and looking at it. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Well, I think what I've seen in the system, I, and I think what every member has seen in the system o over the years, obviously we don't have the nonviolent offenders <laughs> Our, most, of, most of our offenders within the system are violent offenders. And when you consolidate that kind of inmate in a, in, in a uh, uh, concentration, whether it's in a maximum security uh, facility and double bunking plays into that and medium security facilities, you got a recipe for disaster. And I, I've seen this system deteriorate. I work in a program facility for the past almost 20 years. I've seen this system deteriorate to a point where your medium security facilities, you're getting the gangbangers in there who are there to cause trouble and continue their violence. And whether an inmate wants to do his time, wants to be productive, and look at his release, I think we're, we're creating a tough situation for that to happen with the violence. Would you, I mean, when you're looking at the system, the facilities across the state, and if, if my dad is correct, there's a significant number of open beds. Are you, are, are you suggesting that those beds not be filled or, or that they be filled differently? Well, Obviously, when we talk about opening beds, we talk about opening, opening general population beds that we see, and Docs talks about open, open beds all in general, meaning so many inmates are going to reside in special housing units, so many inmates are going to reside in infirmaries, so many inmates are going to be out the court, so they're going to count them as open beds. There's also, in the medium security facilities, there's roughly uh, 34, 3,500 double bunks which causes, again, 68 to 7,000 just in mediums in double bunk situations. We believe there's adequate space to leave, give that wiggle room within a facility to make it appropriate housing and have appropriate staffing. I mean, obviously, we've grown right, over... Right there. The what is appropriate housing? I, I believe appropriate housing is probably 85% population in, in, in your, in your uh, general population because you need enough wiggle room as the, the acting commissioner said if you have issues you need to be able to move, move those inmates. If you're stuffed to the gills in these medium security facilities, certainly some of you have uh, toured them, you're asking for nothing but trouble. Even if you, an inmate would like to do his time, he's forced in a situation, whether it's gang activity or extortion or pressure. And, and with the staff that we have at this point, these facilities are, are staffed to a bare minimum. You mentioned double bunking. Would you comment on that, elaborate on that? Good, bad, creates problems, helps with problems? Your thoughts? I'll... I'll, I'll again use the acting commissioner's uh, words. And let me, let me jump. Please define... What, what double bunking is for us? Well, you. double bunking to me is either double bunking an inmate in a cell or in a cubicle. So if I got a, a dorm that's built for 50, 50 uh, cubicles in an open dorm setting, 
I'm going to house 60 inmates through double bunking by Doc's approach. This is something, as the acting commissioner testified, that I believe it was around 2000, 2001, Doc's con continued to get variances for some 5,000, 5,500 beds, and magically the Commission on Corrections said now they can have house two inmates in a cubicle, and that's fine with us. So they changed the rules and regs so they didn't have to get variances. There was no, you know, big study about 60 inmates opposed to 50 inmates. Are you able to tie safety or, or the, the increase in assaults, whether we call it safety or unsafe conditions, are you able to tie that to double bunking? Again, I, I don't think I can tie it to double bunking, but double bunking is an initiative that was expanded widely in 1990 by then Governor Mario Como, who nine months earlier regretted double bunking inmates in gym, gymnasiums. And he said, his administration said, we regret to do this, but we're out of time, we're out of space, so we're going to expand it. And, and it's, per, it's perceived, it's, it, it's part of the mixture whether it's staffing, double bunking, or a more violent offender. Your belief, all of them contribute, including the Correct. double bunking. Correct. And, and, and I, I think it would be wrong for me, me to sit here or the commissioner to sit here and say double bunking didn't or did cause this. We have the fact sheet. It's Doc's fact sheet. It's not my running assault uh, list because I think that, that would even conflict a little bit. This is Doc's numbers. You mentioned being underfunded. Could you be more specific? Well, I, I really, you know, I think that's obvious from whether it's the comptroller's overtime report to what what happens daily at a, at a facility. I, I believe nobody has taken a look. This this system has been run by a crisis, whether it was in 1999 or today. Nobody's took a step back and, and, and taken a look at appropriate staffing levels, whatever it may be. Uh, we, we passed some, you, you passed shoe, a shoe bill, a, a mental health bill. Appropriate, not appropriate, whatever. The issue is the funding's got to be behind, be behind it, and the staffing's got to be behind it. Well, last question, has NYSCOPA ever taken up its own independent study, brought in an expert, or done any of that stuff on your own, and produced a report? As far as, as, far as staffing, staffing, yes. staffing levels, yes. again, I don't know how what, what kind of effect that would have. I, I believe the best place to deliver it is here. It has to be with funding. It has to be directed funding. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman. So, Assembly Aldrich. <coughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good, Good to see you. Good evening. Right. I'm sorry. Um, just following on. Um, Senator Gallivan's questions. The, the number of security staff has remained constant or gone down in the last four years? Obviously, we've, we've lost probably 21 item, 2,100 items over, over the whole prison closure expansion. So from in a five-year period, there are 21... Less, yeah, that would, that would be from approximately 09. Yeah. Less, less security officers yeah. that are in place at this point in time. And what about program staff? What have you lost in that? Uh, I wouldn't have those numbers. They're not available to me. But nothing that I see from the department seems to indicate that. They seem to indicate that the number of staff stays flat. Um, new classes have been brought in in that period of time. And so, how many new officers have we brought in? Well, I think, it, as uh, the acting commissioner stated, we had trade out roughly 50 officers every two weeks mm -hmm. out of the system. So they, they have to be filled, of course. Right. But, I mean, I, I think what you've seen is a decrease in the number of <clears throat> plot plan posts within the facilities. Explain plot plan posts. Well, I think our plot plans don't reflect actually what we do. Take it 
regional mental health unit mm -hmm. at Marcy Correctional Facility. What, one of the, you know, first in the country. Tough, tough place to work, difficult area. We staff it at a shoestring. They draw out of the resources of a small, medium security facility. When I say small, I mean 1,100, you know, not a, one of our, big, our bigger ones. Um, and they draw on the resources out of it. And that, that causes a strain on the whole on the whole approach, whether it's budget fill levels, plot plan posts, which are posts that DOCS has determined are needed, but they may close in, in certain circumstances. Do, do you think that the reduction in programs that has that seems to have occurred in the last five years adds to making the the, the system unsafe? The programs? No. Yeah. You don't think so. So no, programming. I mean, uh, the, the mental health, the shoe mental health, it's a difficult system. I believe there's duplication and there needs to be some more work between docs and mental health as far as the two entities coming together. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, it hasn't made it more unsafe, but it, it, it's a difficult approach. You're, you're taking a violently, severely mentally ill inmate out of a segregation area to a program area, the program. Is that where you see the increase in violence? As you define no, violence? No, that, that's, that's not total. I mean, that's, that's something we've taken on, and certainly some of these assaults may come from that. Mm -hmm. um, relative to, there's an increase in staff requested based on new programming uh, around the SHUs. Um, how do you see that? Were Again, you aware that that was being proposed? Or? I uh, heard about it last week, mm -hmm. as you heard about it today. Mm -hmm. And the only reason, obviously, it's an interim uh, settlement. It's not, you know, totally, totally finalized. Mm -hmm. The finalization of it, uh, it, it's going to have its issues, especially the segregation of the 16, 17-year-olds. Uh, how that works, we'll see. Let me go back to the relationship between programming, I mean, all educational training, all of those things that are, are offered. We, we made to understand that long waiting list for getting into those programs. And so my question, again, it goes back to the issue as to whether or not you have an uh, inmate who is involved in programs and all of the uh, implications that that might be, as opposed to those who may not be in programs, and does that contribute to institution being safe or unsafe? You know, I, I believe it could contribute. You know, again, I, we, we've had issues with programmed inmates and non-programmed inmates. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, an idle inmate is is not a good thing when it when it comes to uh, whether it's forced gang activity or their, their own gang activity, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Senator Hassel Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to ask some of the same questions, but only because I've been trying to follow this and I'm trying to get clarity, so forgive me if I sound redundant. But <clears throat> I have a, a set of statistics in front of me that says that statewide um, assaults on staff are up 37%, 13.76%. Uh, and um, maximum versus medium facility is up 33% medium, 10% maximum. Um, those are really significant numbers, and they're not just, you know, they're not just uh, percentage-wise, but numerically, they're significant. But yet, I can't understand from what you're saying, or from the commissioner saying, what's the, what, how do you attribute it? The commissioner's response to me was, the type of inmate coming into the prison, um, it's a behavioral issue, not a staffing issue. Yet, I hear you saying, or at least I think you, I hear you saying, 
that it is a staffing issue and it's double bunking. Um, help me with that. Well, certainly the, the type of inmate we have coming into the system is a contributing factor. And, but we started to get, and I'll use the word uptick, we started to get an uptick of violent offenders back in 2001, 2002, where we released the nonviolent offenders and with presumptive release, merit time, and some changes in the laws, we started to get a more violent offender. So that, that has gone on for at least a decade. Okay, because um, you were weeding out some and you had some that were going into um, work release, you had some going into sort of a, a variety of, of different programs as they headed out. But now, um, are the terms longer? I, you know, I don't know how much the terms have changed over the past decade. That's something we really don't follow. But again, it's it. You're in for a violent, a violent offense. You're not in for a drug offense. The majority of them. So I think what I'm saying here is what has happened over the past five years. Yes, we've we've seen an increase in violent offenders coming in. Coming in, we've saw more mandates on, on our facilities, on our agency, to do the old more with less, which my, my members, just like every other uh, public servant, carried on their back, whether it was in negotiations or through this budget process. And what kind of more? Pardon me? How do you constitute more? You said more with less. What kind of more? What is the more that you're asked to do? I think you're asked to, you're, we're asked to, deal with post-closings, whatever it may be, rather than, you know, escorting them to chow, you're going to let them walk because we don't have anybody to staff in between. And again, that comes back to staffing. But again, with these closures, with these closures over the past four or five years, I think this, this, is, a, this is a showing of where we're going with the system. So you're saying even though the, um, the reasons or the justification for closures have been because of significant decrease in um, inmate populations coming into prison, uh, shorter terms, Rockefeller drug law, a variety of things that have occurred over the last five years, you're saying that there is not really a significant decrease in the numbers of inmates, and you're still double bunking. Is that what you're telling me? There, there, there was never adequate space for... Well, I understood that, but I'm saying you're telling me in the last five years. What happened in the last five years? In the last five years, we've closed 11 correctional facilities. We've consolidated dormitories and other facilities, and we've caused a condensed system. Okay. That's not what's being reported everywhere else, and that's what I was trying to get at. Okay. All right. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I appreciate the testimony. The, um, some of the numbers in your, in your testimony, in your written testimony here, um, kind of go along with this theme. Um, even though there's been a decline in inmate, inmate population, you, you say here that the overall system is still at 101% of capacity based on the closures and everything that's, that have gone on and 115% of capacity with the maximum security facilities. Um, and what you're saying is for an optimal level, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Really, we should be closer to 85% capacity in order I, to... You know, again, talking to some previous administrators in this department and, and talking to, to staff, you know, I, I think that would be adequate. you got to remember our reporting as far as the percentage does not include temporary space, does not include SHU space, does not include infirmary space. Because those are segregated areas. They're not, they're not areas would where you could just stick any general population inmate. Can you put some of those percentages in context as, like, say, for the last 
five years, going back to before the the closures started happening, um, were you at a higher percentage uh, capacity, lower? I and mean, what's the? I believe maximums were at what, 122, 122 percent. Mm -hmm. So um, it has. It has decreased. Decreased. Okay. Um, what, what effect will the next four that are proposed uh, now, I mean, is looking at all of the numbers, the incoming, you know, the, the, with through attrition and the number of uh, officers that you have now, uh, what are the, those foreclosures going to do? As far as the inmate population? Uh, yeah, your percentages. I mean, are you going to Obviously, your percentages are going to remain roughly the same because those beds are going to come offline. So if you have... 500 beds at, at Mount McGregor, they're going to come offline. Okay. But I, but I, there, there could possibly, with the inmate population leveling out at the, this time, there could be a little, little bit of a, 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 an uptick. Along those same lines, you, you say that the average inmate to officer ratio in housing unit areas remains over 44 to 1. Uh, that's system wide? Yes. And what's the historical context of, of that number? Well, I think what uh, what docs reports in their fact sheets and what other other states do, they report a one to three ratio. Well, that would mean that I work, you and I work every day, every hour, you know, 365 days a year. That that certainly isn't reasonable. No. Obviously, you have in different facilities, you have different types of security. You need different types of coverage, and obviously you need a relief factor because even correction officers get days off. And as compared to the, your historical ratios, and what's, uh, you know, are you higher, are you trending up, trending down? What's we, the... We remain roughly the same over the years. Okay. But now you have a more violent offender that you're dealing with in a more... You know, and it, it depended on the expansion of, we had an expansion of maximum security space back in 2000, which obviously brings the ratio way up, but you have to remember the coverage in a maximum security facility compared to a medium security facility. Okay. Thank you very much. Senator Nazolio. Thank you. First and foremost, I want to thank all our law enforcement who testified today. The investigators, the troopers, the PBAs, uh, they do uh, great work in uh, analyzing crime, arresting those who are responsible, uh, having them work through the criminal justice system, and then sending them to you, Don, and uh, your members. Uh, all that time for the appropriate arrest and prosecution uh, shouldn't be negated by uh, situations that uh, call for uh, a diversion from appropriate punishment and potential rehabilitation. Uh, you and I and some of them Oaks stood uh, tall against the closure, proposed closure of Butler. Uh, it couldn't help but remember uh, as these discussions unfolded today, people do not realize that the medium security facilities in our state house the most dangerous of criminals possible, uh, that many of our mediums have in them uh, those who've committed uh, very serious violent felonies. There's just no room at the maxis, uh, so they have been deployed to the mediums. Uh, and maybe uh, their uh, conduct in prison uh, is not um, incorrigible. Uh, maybe they qualify for that, but nonetheless, they're still very dangerous. We saw in the mid-90s the mediums explode. I mentioned this to Commissioner uh, today. He remembers, too, when the biggest threats were in our mediums uh, because of the dormitory-type settings. In many cases, uh, those are for the new mediums. We have reasonable sight lines, but for those that were retrofitted uh, to come from other buildings to become mediums uh, were more difficult to manage. From what you're saying today is that there be, is becoming a greater concentration of inmate who has demonstrated and in many cases even been convicted 
of most violent of acts. Now, seeing that grow in our the fewer and fewer mediums that are existing today, uh, where does this go? I, I really think that's that's the question. Where does this go? I think we have to take a step back and we have to take a look at this. We need to take a uh, breath and say, what is appropriate housing? As you said, we retrofitted buildings over the years, cost savings to the taxpayers rather than building uh, new prisons. They have to be handled delicately. You're not talking about an open bay setting. You're talking about dormitories. And with the violent offenders, we've had some very violent acts. We've had a murder at, at Mid-State. We've had, in our, in, whether it's maximum security, we had an attempted murder or correction officer this year. First time in my time that really, really stood out there. We had, a, we had one just a couple of weeks ago. We fully support, not all of us, but many of us support the right-sizing of the correctional system. When two maxis were built in the late 90s and early uh, 2000, uh, those were appropriate. But we can't, it's a fiction to think that the number of maximum security beds across our system is exactly what we need, uh, because that's not the case. I applaud the commissioner for reducing the double bunking, something that's been in existence now for almost 15 in maxim, years. In maximum security. In so maxis. Only. In maxis. Only. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, that still stretches, and where do the, does that violent inmate go? Sooner or later, they trickle into the mediums, uh, as we see. And that, uh, what I fear is history repeating itself uh, with a concentration of most dangerous within our mediums. Uh, that's a story we read in the mid-'90s. Uh, that's the situation that occurred uh, with the, the near riots and so on in the facilities. Um, and I think that's something you're trying to prevent. Um, it, it's... Uh, uh, something that uh, we don't want us ever see that happen, of course. Uh, but we ask uh, the correction officers to work under difficult conditions. We don't want to see those conditions get even more stridently uh, in, um, in danger. Um, in terms of the year that has, is given because of the notice provision that we enacted working with NYSCOBA a few years ago uh, to get that provision, uh, the Governor's complied with that law. Uh, do you, what is your sense of what's being done uh, for uh, the employees now, whether or not there will be jobs for uh, those uh, 50, 45 percent that have yet to declare? Um, what's generally your observation of that condition? Well, it, it, it's a very difficult process, and it's a very personal process. And I've gone out to these facilities, whether it was at the original announcement or at the recent meetings that, that are going to be conducted, have been conducted and are still being conducted. It's, it's a very difficult time. It's, it's a personal decision. Do they wait it out and see if the facility might stay open, might not stay open? So I believe the department is doing everything they can under the budget standard of, of this. But I think under the personal standard, I think the governor, what he did with his announcement in the middle of the summer, two weeks, three weeks after uh, you people left session and announced this, I think it would have been better served if he announced it in January, allowed open dialogue and, and committee dialogue on the issue and the one-year notification the way it was meant to be. To do it by executive fiat, I think, is is a disservice to those communities and it's certainly a disservice to my members. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Don. All right, we've got a couple more in the first round. O'Mara, then Senator Mar Senator O'Mara, then Senator Marshall. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, President Rowe, for being here today. Um, to follow up on your last comments there about this being done by uh, executive fiat under the one-year notice requirement. Now, we went through a round of prison closures, I think, two years ago, where we closed seven facilities. And my recollection is at that time, everybody came to the table and worked on it together. Legislature, NYSCOBA, the administration, um, and that hasn't even been attempted here. 
this round, has it? Have you been brought into the no, table? No, you know, uh, the last time, time that you're talking about, you know, obviously we were, we were in a $10 billion deficit, and it was done very quickly. It, it, there, there was a time limit. They, there wasn't the one-year notification, but at least it went through the budget process. At least it went through the public process. This, this to me, I believe, you know, doing the timing of it was was not a, uh, a very good approach to people who perform a very difficult uh, service for the state. Uh, absolutely do, and I have, as you know, a number of uh, officers uh, in and throughout my district, and they do a great work, and uh, I applaud them. Uh, in your organization for all you do. Uh, I appreciate you uh, summarizing your uh, written testimony here today, but in going through it, I just wanted to, to pick out uh, one line here in particular that says, closing Monterey Shock, which has a special program and a recidivism rate well below the state average, is an especially bad idea uh, from your written testimony. Can you ex expound on that uh, a little bit on why you consider that to be an especially bad idea? Well, I think... And again, I, I hate to point back at him, but I, I like the guy, and that's Acting Commissioner Attorney uh, Anthony Nucci. Uh, acting Commissioner was a proponent. He helped write the laws for shock incarceration. It gave us great relief when we put shock incarceration into, a, into this system to get rid of nonviolent offenders. Um, to take this down... And certainly Monterey, which was not only a model in this state, but a model in the nation, I think is, it's, it's a blow to where we're going. I, I really believe as we take down the work release facilities, the minimum security facilities, and some of these, not, not I, don't, I don't want to say loose, but light mediums, what, we, what we're ending up with is we're just going back to institutionalized warehousing inmates. Do you have any recommendations from your perspective and years of experience on uh, ways that we could continue to expand the eligibility of inmates for the shock program, uh, given the, the high effectiveness of it, the low recidivism rate that we've seen over the years? You know, I'm, I'm not real familiar with how, how we could expand it legally. Um, but again, I think there's enough room with the what we have out at, at Lakeview. Again, Lakeview is packed full. And to give Lakeview a little wiggle room, they have platoons waiting to go into their session. Why, why wouldn't you just move those to Monterey? I, again, I think it's a shell, shell game. Is we're going to stuff Lakeview full because it's a bigger place, and we're just going to run the sessions through slower and say, oh, we don't have enough inmates. Now, to follow up on that, and it was going to be my next point, uh, I have... Um, numbers uh, from docs that we received uh, as of January 31st that shows uh, between 250 to 300 um, shock eligible inmates in the system waiting to be assigned to a platoon. Um, Monterey's capacity is 300 inmates. Uh, I believe Mariah is at capacity and as you talk about Lakeview being where they are, it seems to me we have the need uh, for this facility uh, and the readily available inmates um, to be able to put in that facility. And I hear anecdotally from uh, your membership that, uh, that uh, those numbers, uh, they feel, are on the low side, and there's actually uh, more of a backlog of inmates uh, that could be ready for the system, that uh, you know, maybe the numbers are being played with to make it look like there's not so much of a need, even though, as I agree, as you said, with the numbers that they document themselves, and uh, uh, the capacity of the, of the facilities, the two remaining facilities, there is that need uh, without that right now. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, at, at any given day, I can, I can shuffle their numbers. Mike's, Mike's my numbers guy. He can shuffle <coughs> their numbers just, just like uh, they can shuffle their numbers. <coughs> and again, it, and it comes down to available space and how you use it. Uh, I have also heard anecdotally that there is uh, some capital improvement work going on at Lakeview that would expand the capacity of that facility. Have you been uh, uh, not, picking not up that anything I've been like that? To, not that I've been privy to. But I just found out they took down the double box in Great Meadows. So. <laughs> that's, where I, that's where I started off. Thank you. Senator Marchion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I would like to also start off by thanking 
all of our uh, of our police agencies in the state. And, and Don, I certainly want to thank you for your dedication and your principled leadership of what I look at as a very difficult time in Nyscopa's history over the last five years. Um, you know, that's almost five a year that you have been facing and uh, in, the, in, the, in the membership that you represent. Um, in your expert opinion, you know, targeting, what's been targeting public safety, some have called it, you know, a war on public safety. Um, can you tell me, I mean, as I, we should know, but I, I do want to ask the question, how's the morale of your uh, professionals, your public safety professionals at this time? Uh, well, I'm not going to lie to you as far as docs is concerned and the correction personnel, is, it's, it's very low. And I, I believe public servants all over, all over the country and certainly in this state, it's very low. But when you do a difficult job like we do, I don't... Uh, you know, pretend my, we're any different than any other. We go about our business behind walls, behind fences every day. But I, uh, as we talked about in 2011, when we were talking about a $10 billion deficit, um, it's a little easier to stomach to do more than less and put your, put your neck on the line and even at the negotiating table. But at the end of the day, when we're in a budget session that is going to produce some miracle two billion dollar uh, surplus next year or the year after, and we're taking these kind of cuts in, in public safety. It, it has a severe impact on morale, and morale is all you got when you're working behind the wall. That's right. Um, some of your membership, I'm sure, have already been shifted to another another site. Are they being asked to travel a great deal in order to keep their jobs? Uh, at, at this point, they're, they're moving voluntarily. They've been moving voluntarily. You know, it's a sad day when I got to walk in a correctional facility, which I did last summer, and see people I started with, worked with, and say, look, you know, what, what should I do? What should I do? And I tell them, Mike tells them, the rest of our executive board tells them, you know, this is a personal decision for you. Whether you want to stay, you, you, it's all about keeping an employment. If you want to keep, if you need to keep employment, if you're not going to retire or whatever, you need to make some tough decisions. And, and again, we're not talking about moving people from agency building one to agency building two, nine to five, weekends and holidays off. We're talking about somebody that's going from maybe a day shift, weekend off job to another facility, and now he's going to have to work afternoons or whatever. And we're talking about child care and disruption and travel. Yeah, I got just a quick glimpse of that when I was at Mount McGregor and people were there in the sea of the orange shirts and their faces just told me everything that you're verbalizing to me at this time, a very, very difficult time. It brings for, you back to your human reality real quick. I absolutely did. Um, I'd like to just talk about Mount McGregor for just a, just a few minutes. Um, Mount McGregor has an infirmary on site, and I know that there are not many infirmaries um, what's, what's the loss of that infirmary to the prison system? Well, it causes diff different travel patterns as far as, uh, as, as, far as facility transport transportation when it comes to infirmaries. Does it, uh, 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 does it add to uh, the cost if you're not able to get to a facility to have to it, hit a hospital? And obviously, I, I, I believe there, you know, there, there would obviously be a cost factor in there depending on what facilities were serviced there, and if they'll have available space at the other, at, at the other facilities. Okay. I just want to, just one more question, I want to step back into the idea that do we need to step back on this? And um, we heard uh, Acting Commissioner tell us that he was told in May that this needed to occur by July. They made the decision, and I mean, this will be prison closure number 15. Boy, it just seems to be, and I'll ask your opinion of this, it just seems to be that there needs to be some planning beyond fixing prison windows in two of our prisons, mine up to $2.8 million, and now closing the facility. It just doesn't seem that there's a lot of planning or any planning, and I doubt if there's planning relative to buildings, what kind of planning has there been in personnel and, and, and just the, 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 the human side of, and, and, in, and inmates as well. Um, can you comment on that? 
You know, I, I really can't comment on that because I, we weren't asked to participate in that, and you would think we would be. But, again, I think it's this zero growth, cut spending. I'm a taxpayer. I love those words. But let's do it correctly. And I believe that was the, it was a budgetary approach, and it was done that quickly. And whether the department feels they can pull it off or we're told to pull it off, that's where we are today. I'm a conservative as well, President. But, boy, you really need to look at the full scope of what we're doing here for the, the amount that we're going to be saving. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. To close, Senator Gallivan. To close expeditiously, Senator Gallivan. And I will. Thank you. You spoke about uh, Assemblyman Walters brought up your written testimony about the system at 101% capacity, max facilities 115% capacity, which you explained very well. Could you provide me, my office with that data? Certainly. Uh, secondly, you had talked, I, I think it might have been about an incident at Auburn. It may not have. But you've got correction officers on the various posts. Some incident takes place in the air or wherever that requires a response. So you've got the correction officer that is working that particular post, first responder, obviously uh, numerous inmates involved. Others are assigned to respond. Do I understand correctly that they are pulled off different posts to respond? Or is there a team that's available to respond to the Without getting very, very public with how we respond to emergencies. Understood. What, what we don't have is we don't have a goon squad sitting sitting around waiting to respond, as you know the movie critics might might say. Well, let's put it in a more professional. I would, that's what, what I was look. That's well, really what I wanted to know. Well, what I would think, you call an emergency you know, response I, team? Pardon? We, an emergency response team? We or something? We have to emergency that response posts, but you have to realize that they they vacate posts to respond. It isn't like that. That's their sole function. <laughs> Did it used to be? Or no, let me ask you, no. is, is there a need for a team like that to be available? I, I believe at this point in a, in a maximum security facility, you should have certain amount, certain amount of staff that's flexible enough to respond without causing coverage issues or whatever it may be, and, and also an immediate security facility. All right, thanks. And finally, thanks I mean, to you and your membership for the work they do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you. Correctional Association of New York.